is we usually do a uh, trivia question, or in some cases two, to uh, sort of introduce people to the subject matter. That uh, the trivia question essentially is, what was uh, Abner Doubleday's role in the uh, founding of baseball? And uh, of course the answer to that question is none. Exactly. Uh, and that's part of the point of the mythology of baseball. The Doubleday story is in fact created out of whole cloth, uh, largely for the purpose of satisfying Al Spaulding, who was the major driving force in the formation of the National League, and Al Spaulding was a pitcher from Chicago, although he also pitched in, in Boston. And Spaulding was a man who believed that the game of baseball was the great American game and that it had to have American roots. Now, there was a slight problem with Mr. Spaulding's attitude, and that was that the editor of the Spaulding Official Baseball Guide was a man named Henry Chadwick. And Mr. Chadwick was born in England and emigrated to the United States. But of course, he brought with him his childhood experiences in England, and he knew that baseball was not an invention, but that it was a derivative game, and that baseball is derived from several sources uh, a whole history of bat and ball games uh, that go back probably thousands of years. As a matter of fact, uh, Robert Henderson, who was the chief librarian of the New York Public Library System, had, uh, did a book in 1947 called Bat, Ball, and Bishop, in which he traces the history of bat and ball games back to the ancient Greeks and Egyptian civilizations. In any case, Henry Chadwick knew that baseball was derived from a number of games, including the British game of rounders, which is a game largely played even now by schoolgirls in England. And Spaulding was handicapped by the fact that he couldn't make his point that America had solely created and invented baseball, uh, as long as Henry Chadwick was editing the official guide, which in fact had Spaulding's name on it. This inconvenience was done away with in 1908, when Henry Chadwick finally died. And Al Spaulding then convened a commission uh, called the Mills Commission to investigate the origins of baseball. Their instructions were to find an American birthplace for baseball and an American creator for the game of baseball. So their investigation largely revolved around trying to find somebody or someone, some story, something that fit Mr. Spaulding's requirements. As it happens, they managed to dig out of a mental institution in Colorado, a, a, a fellow who absolutely remembered uh, his childhood hero, uh, Abner Doubleday, uh, on a summer day in 1839 in Cooperstown, New York, inventing the game of baseball. It sprang whole and fully formed from his mind, was laid out on the field at Cooperstown, and the children immediately adopted the rules, played the game, and baseball lived happily ever after. Unfortunately, that story is totally fictitious, has no relationship to reality, and as a matter of fact, if Abner Doubleday had been in Cooperstown in the summer of 1839, he would have been AWOL from West Point because he was a sophomore, and in those days, the sophomores or cows were not allowed to leave the reservation. So General Doubleday lived a long and useful life, was uh, one of the principal figures in the beginning of the Civil War. He didn't actually start it, but he was president at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, and was one of the officers who fired the first shot for the Union Army, and left when he died in Mendham, New Jersey in 1894, voluminous diaries about every phase of his life, uh, and never was in over 70 volumes of diaries, even mentions attending a baseball game. The word baseball does not appear in any of General Doubleday's diaries. So it's safe to assume that since he was unaware that he invented the game, chances are he didn't. However, Abner Graves, who's our friend from Colorado, insisted to the Mills Commission that he had. The Mills Commission, now having fulfilled its mission, creating an American mythology for baseball, accepted the report, shut up shop, and published the whole data as presented. Unfortunately, 
has no bearing to reality. The real reality of baseball is, as Henry Chadwick suggested, that baseball is a derivative game and is derived from many sources. If anyone is entitled to claim the uh, invention of baseball as his and his alone, it's probably a man named Cartwright who lived and worked here in New York. And Mr. Cartwright was a member of the Knickerbocker Club, which was one of a number of sports clubs that uh, generated exercise and team sports for young men in the years before the Civil War. And Cartwright's team played a lot of town ball or the Massachusetts game, uh, which are various forms of rounders or baseball derived from cricket, all of these various and sundry games. And Cartwright, among others, was dissatisfied with the nature of these games. One of the problems with it was that the batters ran from post to post or stake to stake, and during their trips between the bases, in order to be put out, they had to be soaked. Soaking meant you hit them with the ball. And of course, if you're standing eight feet away and you fire a ball at this fella and hit him in the ribs, it can be a rather excruciating experience. They're put out in more ways than one. In any case, Cartwright, who had some engineering training, or actually draftsman training, I think engineering is probably overstating a little bit, studied the concept of trying to create a game that emulated the exercise potential that these games did and eliminated some of the problems of the games. And in 1845, he created a list of what were originally called the Knickerbocker Rules, and uh, they are the basis for the game of baseball. And in fact, in 1846, those rules were printed in a little pamphlet by a company that's still in business in New York, Bowen and Company which was a financial printer and is now a major online financial printer. And downtown bound, we used to call them in the financial business, B-O-W-N-E, and they printed a small booklet containing the Knickerbocker rules. Now, there were several other clubs in New York, and this is a point that people frequently miss at that time that were engaged in similar kinds of activities. They weren't all solely created to play the game of baseball under the Knickerbocker rules. Many of them existed already or they were extensions of volunteer fire companies and various other social activities. But most of these clubs decided to adopt the rules of the Knickerbocker Club, and for many years there was a story that baseball played its first organized game in June of 1846 at Elijah Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey, when the Knickerbockers played a team called the New York Nine. Now, New York Nine won the game handily, which raises the obvious question of, if the Knickerbockers were the only club in existence, where did all these players come from who were so much better than they were? The answer is that they were members of other teams. And the other teams were teams in New York and Brooklyn, three or four of them, which adopted the Knickerbocker rules. And we now have evidence that indicates that the famous game in June of 1846 in Elijah Fields in Hoboken was in fact not the first organized baseball game played, that there were several preceding it, and including some in the late summer and fall in September and October of 1845. And at least one of those was also played in Elijah Fields. So Hoboken still has a hand in, but some of them were played in Brooklyn and the original Knickerbocker practices were held in what is now Washington Square Park in Manhattan. And the park was shaped a little bit differently then than it is now. It's undergone two or three renovations in 1845. In fact, one just recent. But uh, it was where the team held its workouts. So you could probably make a claim that Madison Square Park is the incubator for the game of baseball. But in any case, what it originally began as a recreation for gentlemen. These are bank clerks, merchants, people who work in stores, work on the docks, 
work on as uh, import and export supervisors. This is a game for the gentleman sportsman. One of the reasons that Cartwright redesigned the game is to eliminate a lot of the physical hazards. Created a game where three outs make an inning and the teams change sides. Created a game with bases that were set 90 feet apart in a square or diamond shape. And the game that they played would be recognizable today as a game of baseball. Would probably look something like baseball in Walt's time, but it would be recognizable as a game of baseball. And Cartwright and his people were, however, ardent amateurs. This was not a game that was created for professionals. It wasn't created essentially for the working class. It was essentially created for the gentleman sportsman. People who felt that they had uh, a right to leisure time, which the lower classes didn't have in those days. Most of the time, the people who worked the stevedores on the docks or people who drove wagons, the so-called draymen or teamsters, people who did the deliveries, ran the messages, most of them worked six days a week or seven and were happy to have the job. They didn't have a lot of time to play baseball, especially since you couldn't get paid for it. So you have to have a picture of this as a game that was created as a recreation, essentially, for a class of people who, while not wealthy and certainly not qualifying as aristocrats, are in the embryo middle class of the developing American industrial society. They are people who have an income and can afford to take an afternoon or two off a week to practice and to play games and to gather on a Saturday afternoon and take the boats to Hoboken and play baseball. So that what you essentially have here is a, a middle class or upper middle class recreational game. By the eight, in middle 1850s, even some of the colleges start to join in, and you, but they are representing the same class of people. The colleges are peopled with men, almost exclusively men in those days, who have a family background that can afford them the opportunity to take four years not working, and not only that, to pay somebody to teach them something. So essentially you're looking at, again, an upper middle class or even the bottom fringes of the upper class are the people who are playing this game. One of the problems with all of this is that the Cartwright rules, or the Knickerbocker rules, created a very interesting and exciting and in some ways intricate game that started to fascinate a lot of people. In those days, there were very few team sports that were public recreations and not that many spectator sports. There was, of course, horse racing. There was boxing, although it was illegal. It took place anyhow. And there was some cricket. There were organized cricket games. And in fact, until the 1940s, when the start of World War II in the United States, there were cricket leagues that were fairly active in the New York area, two or three of them, with several clubs in each. But in any case, baseball begins to create a public fascination. This brings more people into the, to the, the spectator area. People start attending games who are not members of the club. And in 1862, a fellow in Brooklyn very creatively decides there's a way to make money here. You do anything in the United States long enough and somebody will figure out a way to make a buck with it. And hopefully uh, lots of bucks. And a fellow named Bill Kammeyer, William Kammeyer, bought an old skating rink in Brooklyn and converted it into a field where baseball clubs could play their games. And the deal was he went to the clubs and said, look, I'll let you use the field and I will provide this facility but I will charge admission to the game. So you get a place to play, and I get to keep the money. And they figured, since they were not in this for the money, in fact, most members of baseball teams contributed membership fees to their clubs for the privilege of being on the team and paid for their own uniforms. They accepted the deal. So Kammeyer has now got himself a business. So he starts to, with basically three clubs, 
to play games for money in 1862. The fact that there was a war going on didn't seem to phase anybody, uh, particularly in New York where the Civil War was pretty unpopular. So a dime admission was charged. However, by the end of the Civil War, the idea of this being a business is now catching on, and it's catching on big time in New York and Brooklyn. Now, it's important to bear in mind that at this point in time, Brooklyn is a separate city. Brooklyn is not part of New York. Greater New York, as we now know it, was created in 1898 after years of political maneuvering and also public referenda where various towns and cities around Manhattan were asked to join in and to vote uh, to become members of the city of New York. At that time, what is now the Bronx was also part of New York County, uh, at least the southern portion of the Bronx, and Manhattan basically constituted the city of New York. Queens and Brooklyn were rather dragged into the merger. Brooklyn was in effect told to join, and part of that is a political story where uh, the Republicans believed that by adding Republican votes in Brooklyn, they would give them a fighting chance to get capture City Hall, which was in, in what is essentially a democratic city even then, uh, and to, to some degree it worked. Uh, shortly after consolidation, there were a couple of Republican and a couple of reform mayors. But basically, uh, Tammany Hall figured out a way to, to handle that problem too, but that's a digression. The point here is, that as an independent city, Brooklyn develops the kind of feisty pride that it, it is known for. And one of the ways it expresses itself is in the competition with New York in various sports events. And Brooklyn is a big hotbed of baseball. It is not an accident that Brooklyn had its own Major League Baseball team. In any case, by the end of the Civil War and in the middle 1860s, the clubs wake up to the idea that Mr. Kammeyer and a couple of other people who have now gotten into this business have a pretty good thing going here when they can attract several thousand people on a Saturday or a holiday. There were very few sports on Sundays in those days. That when you can attract a few thousand people, and if they're paying a dime or paying a quarter or whatever, if it's a major match game, sometimes it's a quarter, that uh, they're putting away a lot of money. And they probably paid off their investment in the ballpark long before. We're still paying for our uniforms, buying our own shoes, hiring umpires, showing up and playing games, and somebody else is making the money. Even if you're a gentleman amateur sportsman, this does not strike you as a good business. So the clubs start to say, wait a second. Let's divvy this up a little bit differently. We want to share the spoils. Now, at the outset, you really don't have professional clubs because they don't pay the players. The players are still members. But the clubs, in fact, start to collect money to phrase their expenses. It pays for the uniforms. The umpires' expenses are paid for, and the salary is paid to the umpires for, for out of the gate receipts. Okay. So now, in the 1860s, we have essentially the beginnings of a professional business. There is a national organization for this sport, and the fact that there was a civil war helped to spread the popularity of baseball because the troops from the areas where baseball was played took the game with them and induced it to other groups of troops in their own army, and in fact even in the Confederate army because baseball was introduced as a recreation in some prison camps, so the Confederates became familiar with the game as well. And in fact, it became very, very popular in the South after the Civil War. But in any case, as far as New York is concerned, we're now developing a whole cadre of sort of semi-professional clubs, teams that charge for admission but don't pay the players. The Eagles, the Gothams, join in with the Knickerbockers. The Knickerbockers remain pure amateurs. And when, even when the national organization of baseball players decided to recognize the potential of professional players. The Knickerbockers resigned from the organization, even though they had been the club that had helped organize it originally. So that those people adhered to what I guess in this day and age we 
those of us of a certain age anyway refer to as the Avery Brundage rule of life, and that is that no athlete shall ever be compensated for his exertions, no matter how great they may be, no matter how successful he may become. And if you're independently wealthy like Mr. Brundage was, this is probably a reasonably good policy. For the rest of us, it stinks. So athletes begin to put their hand out. And at the start, we have sub rows of payments where athletes, people like Al Reach of Philadelphia, are collecting money on the table. They're getting paid, but they're keeping quiet about it. And there were clearly several New York clubs that were doing the same thing. And in fact, one of the better known clubs in New York was the, the Mutual Club, which was actually a volunteer fire company. And the Mutual Baseball Club uh, acquired several volunteer firemen who were surprisingly skilled at playing baseball, although their ability to fight fires is not as well defined. Nevertheless, the baseball team got better. And that seemed to be the objective. By the way, one of the members of the mutual company at one time was a man named William Marcy Tweed, who found several other ways to make a good deal of money. But in any event, with the development of these clubs, there develops a rivalry. What happens when you develop a rivalry is one guy says, OK, I'm going to build a team that's better than your team. The other guy says, oh, yeah. So the rules start to get very elastic. Well, finally, in 1869, the Cincinnati Red Stockings throw off the shackles and say, OK, we've had enough shamateurism. We know everybody's getting paid who's any good at this. So we're just going to form a professional club and tour the country. They do. And in 1869, in fact, finish unbeaten, traveled throughout the entire Northeast and Midwest, and win all their games. In 1870, they do it again. And probably the most famous baseball game in the first 25-year history of the game of baseball is played in Brooklyn, the Capital Line Grounds, in June of 1870, when the undefeated Cincinnati Reds, who have not lost a game since they began in the spring of 1869, they did play one tie because the team walked off the field uh, when the game was tied, wouldn't continue that they play the Brooklyn Atlantics at the Capitol Line grounds in Brooklyn. Now at this point, this game is likewise tied, and under the rules then prevailing, the captains, who actually stood in for professional managers, but they haven't arrived at that point in the game's development as yet, the captains could agree to call a draw. However, the Reds agreed to continue to play. And in fact, uh, scored a run to go ahead seven to six. But the Atlantics come back, score two uh, in, in their half of, of the, the tenth, and win the game eight to seven, ending the Cincinnati Reds' winning streak, which at that point in time was somewhere in the 80s. Uh, there's some argument about exactly how many games they played. But in any case, there was a very large crowd for this game. We're talking about a crowd of 10 to 12,000 people, which in 1870 was very unusual. Large crowd that large for anything in New York or anywhere else was quite unusual. So now what we understand is that this is not just a business. It might be an industry. And where we are in American history at this point is we're on the cutting edge of the development of the American capitalist society. The Civil War created American industry and in effect created American capitalism because it made it worthwhile to build things in vast quantities. You had a ready-made sale because you could sell all of the wagons you could make, all the rifles you could make, all the blankets you could sell. You could sell them to the army because there was a war on and we were trying to equip troops by the thousands. And as a result, there developed industry, coal mining, railroads, all of the things connected with the development of American industry received an enormous shot in the arm because of the Civil War. You also have an attitudinal issue here because people now start to believe that maybe making a buck isn't such a bad idea. 
and what has been promulgated from the top for the last hundred years uh, about them that Scott keeps and them that don't work um, may not be the philosophy we want to adopt. Maybe everybody's got a shot at making a buck here. And so what happens is that by 1871, there are enough professional baseball clubs in the, in the United States, all in the Northeast and Midwest, to form a league. A league is formed, the National Association of Professional Baseball Players is formed, and at various times, uh, a couple of New York teams and about three or four from Brooklyn join in uh, and participate in this league over a period of the years of its existence from 1871 to 1875. Anyway, the point is that the Mutuals are partners with Mr. Kammerer in the use of the Union grounds in Brooklyn. And the Mutuals become quite active in the National Association. Now this is a fairly loose organization by contemporary standards. Clubs come and they go. Sometimes clubs play half a season and quit. Other teams join in when the season's already started. And, and it becomes a little bit chaotic. Uh, it's the kind of thing that undoubtedly would drive anybody with an organized mind to a bit of a frenzy. But this is all new. People are feeling their way. There is no model for this. And more or less, people figure, hey, you know, let's do what we want to do and see how it works out. There are, however, some statistics kept. There are some records. There is a good deal of coverage. And baseball begins to develop a following as an organized league sport. This concept seems to work that all the major cities, New York, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, Brooklyn, have teams in the league, sometimes more than one, and that there is excitement among the populace. Our team is better than your team. There is a pennant race. People get excited about this. It's also complicated by the fact that there's a fire in Chicago, and the Chicago club spends his entire season on a road and in fact winds up playing Philadelphia on the last day of the season in Brooklyn trying to win the pennant, which they don't. But in any case, there is a, an organizational structure idea, a concept that is emerging. As the years go by, 1872, 1873, 1874, there is growing dissatisfaction with this issue. There should be a more stable structure, a lot of people think. One of the guys who thinks this is Al Spaulding. And Al Spaulding decides that he's going to organize some of the better Midwestern clubs into a league and then try to bring in enough Eastern teams to make a league out of this thing. Only this is not going to be run by team captains or by players who decide to show up when they feel like it or teams that decide to play when they want to. This is going to be run by owners. There's an ownership concept now, where in fact, the management takes charge of the team. There is an owner, president in most cases, of the team. And there is a club secretary who arranges the schedules, handles the travel, makes sure that the players are on time and people get paid collects the money from the box office, in effect, a businessman. So now you have a business. And in February of 1876, at the old Broadway Central Hotel, there is a meeting of the four principal Western teams, Western cities, who have been in the National Association over the period of the recent five seasons. And there is also a meeting of a half a dozen Eastern clubs. And essentially what happens is that Morgan Bulkley, who is a prominent political figure in Connecticut, persuades several New York uh, and Brooklyn owners to attend the meeting. And he decides that the Hartford Club will join the new league. He also persuades his friends in Boston to do likewise. And you wind up with New York, Philadelphia, and Boston joining in the league, and one of the Brooklyn clubs decides not to join at the last minute. You wind up with an eight-team league, the National League of Professional Baseball Clubs. 
operative word here is clubs rather than players. The clubs are in charge. The clubs are run by the owners, run by the manager. And the players have had the whip hand in the organization of baseball since 1845. It started out as a recreation. It's now a business. A business needs a structure. A structure needs management. Management needs a boss. So what you have is, in effect, it now becomes an industry. And in 1876, they play an eight-game, uh, eight-team league, plays a season. Club secretaries are still arranging their own schedules. The club secretary of Chicago writes to the club secretary of Philadelphia and says, we are going to be in the East uh, during the month of uh, June and August. What days would you like to play? So there's still a certain haphazard arrangement here. All of that goes out the window at the end of the season. When New York and Philadelphia, who are not in the pennant race, decide they're not going to take the last trip west, why spend the money? It's no reason to go to St. Louis and Chicago. You can't win the pennant anyway. It doesn't make any difference if you won all your games. So they just fold up and go home. The season isn't over, but they're done. At which point, the league meeting in Cleveland becomes a very heated affair. And the upshot of the whole thing is that Bulkley, who was the president of the league and later became the governor of Connecticut and the United States senator from Connecticut, expels New York and Philadelphia at the insistence of, of Bill Hulbert, who was the president of the Chicago Cubs, and Al Spaulding, who was the real formative force behind this whole thing. And then he resigns as president and makes a deal with the owner of the New York team, Bill Kammeyer, who also happens to own the ballpark, that they will play Hartford's home games in Brooklyn. So Kammeyer decides not to protest the issue, and New York and Philadelphia, the two largest cities in the United States, are expelled from the National League, which in fact the following year plays with the 16th League. But what you've done here is that in the space of about 30 years, we have gone from essentially a sophisticated sandlot recreation to, in fact, a business where there is a management, there is a structure, and somebody is saying, hold it. You have a game to play. You're going to play the game. You said you're going to start at 2.30. You better be here. And we will, we will make the schedules from now on, which, starting in 1877, the National League draws the schedule and tells the clubs when to play. They don't ask them anymore. So they begin assigning professional umpires. The league central office takes care of that issue. It's not a local hire anymore. Everybody gets to recommend who they think is pretty good, but the league makes the ultimate decisions. So now, all of a sudden, you have a league that is very recognizable by modern standards, at least up until a few weeks ago. Uh, the National League uh, did a reasonably good job for 125 years of organizing and promoting the sport of baseball. And one of the reasons was it created stability. If a schedule was published in February that said Brooklyn was going to be at New York on July 4th for a doubleheader, you could take that to the bank. Unless it rained, there would be a doubleheader between Brooklyn and New York in the Polo Grounds on the 4th of July. That's how business operates. And essentially, that's what these guys did. They brought that concept. However, we don't have baseball in New York, so it doesn't really matter a whole lot. A fellow named John B. Day decided to do something about that. John Day, who was a baseball fan, was also a merchant, formed a team called the Metropolitan Baseball Club, and they started to play in the polo grounds in 1880 as an independent team when National League teams came through town, Chicago goes to Boston, plays a series in Boston on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then they're going to Philadelphia. On their way, they stop in New York and they play a couple of games against the Mets. 
on Friday and Saturday. And then they go to Philadelphia where you can't play Sunday ball. So they play Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in, in Philadelphia. And they get on the train and go back to Chicago. In the meantime, they picked up a payday in the middle by playing in New York where there is no National League team. So the Mets become a thriving business. John D. Day becomes a hero with all the National League owners. And when a competing league arises, the Metropolitan Baseball Club joins the American Association. And now at least we have something akin to Major League Baseball in New York. But in the meantime, his friends in the National League contact Mr. Day and they say, listen, John, the uh, Troy franchise doesn't support itself. They're available. And they have some talent. And you can buy that franchise. They'll retire from the league and you can move it to New York. Which indeed he does. So in 1883, all of a sudden we have two teams in two different leagues playing in the polo ground. The Mets and the Giants, or the team that becomes known as the Giants. At the outset, they were just known as the New York Ball Club, and a lot of people called them the Gothams or whatever. There was a whole scramble as to what uh, the name was going to be. And in those days, we didn't have the marketing company that went out and did the survey and uh, told you that the preferred name was. And then we had the contest, and everybody emailed in 8,000 poopy answers. In those days, it was simply a question of the owner picking the name he liked. And eventually, the team became known as the Giants. So when you're for the Giants in 1883, they weren't actually known as the Giants, but that's the team we know as the New York Giants, played in New York for 75 years. Now there's a whole story about the polo grounds and how it came to be, but I think in the interest of time, we're going to probably pass on that issue today. There were, in fact, two different polo grounds, and they was originally built as a field for polo by a newspaper publisher named James Gordon Bennett. The original polo grounds was on 110th Street and Fifth Avenue. In any case, meanwhile, in Brooklyn, which is still an independent city in the 1880s, a guy named Charlie Byrne decides that the city, which still has several amateur clubs, should have a professional team again. So he creates, in 1882, a team that joins a minor league, the Interstate League, and that is a team that eventually becomes known as the Brooklyn Dodgers. They likewise join the new American Association when this league, created as a rival for the National League, is formed and actually was originally created because the Midwestern towns that did not belong to the National League, or even some that did, had a problem because the National League did not permit Sunday baseball, did not permit the sale of beer in the ballparks, and wanted to charge 50 cents a seat, not the traditional quarter. And there are a lot of owners who didn't agree with any of that. They said, I'd rather charge a quarter and sell beer. I can make just as much money or more. And I get a larger crowd because at half the price, in a day when a worker made a dollar a day was doing well. So two bits is not an inconsequential amount of money. And if you double the price to 50 cents, you're now saying, OK, the guy's going to come down on Saturday afternoon. He's going to bring his wife and two children. And he's going to spend $2 for tickets. It's two days worth of wages. It means he worked Monday and Tuesday for the ball club, and he worked Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to, to pay the rent and feed the family. That doesn't necessarily appeal to a lot of people. So some of the owners who wanted to make the money up by selling beer and food in the ballpark, not pay, charge 50 cents, helped form the American Association, which had very strong teams at the beginning in St. Louis and Cincinnati. And they were the driving force behind the league. But the Mets joined that league, and in fact, in 1884, won the pennant. Brooklyn also joins the league. And in 1889, they won the pennant in the American Association and played the Giants in the World Series, which, as one might imagine, created a good deal of excitement. He asked the Giants won. Then Byrne decides that he might be better off in the National League, which is, after all, a little more stable. And in 1890, the Brooklyn Dodgers, or the team we know as the Dodgers, joined the National League. So now the Giants and the Dodgers are in the National League. And from 1890 to 1957, that's where they stay. Uh, the Dodgers played in several ballparks in Brooklyn, Eastern Park, and about three versions of Washington Park. 
before Evans Field was opened in 1913. Meanwhile, the Giants had moved twice before winding up in the polo grounds of my childhood, which was at 155th Street and 8th Avenue. In any case, the uh, two National League teams are now established. Uh, and in the 1890s, they are not necessarily good teams. At the end of the decade, there was syndicate ownership where two or three guys owned pieces of or entire teams in two different towns. The owners of Cleveland also owned St. Louis, for example. There were four different ball clubs involved in the ownership of the Giants. One of the major owners of the Giants was also the owner of the Boston Braves. And this syndicate kind of ownership was also a bit of a problem, and they finally decided to clean up this mess. And as it happens, the people who owned Baltimore, the famous Orioles of the 1890s, also had principal interest in Brooklyn, where Charlie Evans was their partner since Byrne had died. And they decided to transfer a lot of their better players from Baltimore to Brooklyn because it was a bigger market. Brooklyn was the third largest city in the United States behind New York, the rest of the city, and Chicago. So this was a very rapidly growing area where this, this is where they wanted to be. So in 1899 and 1900, Brooklyn has a very good team augmented by a lot of the stars from the old Baltimore Orioles. It is in this environment that the uh, Yankees are created because a new league is formed. The old Western League becomes the American League. The name changed in 1900 and to a certain degree expansion to Major League status in 1900. When the National League contracted after the 1899 season, they reduced the league from 12 teams to eight. And a lot of the teams like Baltimore, Washington, are sloughed off, Cleveland. Most of the places where there's double ownership, Barney Dreyfus owned Louisville and Pittsburgh. So the league said, OK, pick one, pick Pittsburgh. The Robinson brothers owned Cleveland and St. Louis. And they said, pick one. So they picked St. Louis. So all of the teams that were not picked by their owners, most of their talent goes to the other team you own. And the franchise was out of business. So four teams out of 12 that had played through the 1890s, some of them derived from the merger with the American Association, are sloughed off. And those markets become available. And the American League rapidly moves into those markets. And in 1900, they had teams in Chicago and Cleveland. They had the team in Kansas City, team in Milwaukee, they had teams that would be recognizable today as American League City. However, they do not claim Major League status because there was a ruse under which the Comiskey people moved into Chicago. The ruse was they went to Hart, the owner of the Chicago Cubs in the National League, and said, look, you don't have an objection to us operating a minor league team on the south side of town. The Cubs were then playing at West Side Grounds. And Hart said, no, nah, not really. But as long as it's only a minor league team, I don't have a problem. So they built the ballpark, and they started playing on the South Side. And they had told Hart that the American League was a minor league. So they couldn't very well tell the sports writers the reverse. But in their minds, they were building a major league here. Dan Johnson, who was the president, originally a sports writer in Cincinnati, Charlie Comiskey, a fellow named Summers from Cleveland, who was also the original back of the Boston Red Sox, were creating a major league here. And they thought they had a major league on their hands. They decided that they shouldn't say anything until they had finished building the ballpark and established themselves in Chicago, which is critical to their developmental plan. In 1901, they announced that they are a major league, and they started adding Eastern teams, like a second team in Boston, a second team in Philadelphia, as well as teams in Washington and Baltimore. Now, a war breaks out. 
And the National League is absolutely determined that this new league, the upstart invaders, will not have a team in New York. At the time, the Giants were owned by a man named Andrew Friedman, who was very politically well connected with Tammany Hall. And any time Van Johnson and his potential owners in New York, he originally had a coal merchant, a guy named Gordon, who was going to be the backer of the New York team. Any time they found the spot, Tammany Hall, as soon as the plans were filed to build a ballpark, Tammany Hall would order a street cut through the middle of a lot so it wasn't big enough to accommodate a ballpark. This cat and mouse game goes on for a couple of years, and there are actually two or three other things going on as well. John McGraw, who was the manager of the American League team in Baltimore, jumps and becomes part of the, the National League and becomes, in 1902, the manager of the Giants in New York, and has a bit of feud going on with Van Johnson. But these are all stories unto themselves. What's focal for the history of baseball in New York is how the Yankees got here. What Van Johnson finally decided to do was to fight fire with fire. This is a political game. I'll bring in people who are politically well connected. He has led to a guy named Frank Farrell, who is a casino owner. And Frank Farrell, operating a casino in New York, by the very nature of operating a casino in New York, uh, is politically well connected. Nothing further really needs to be said. And Farrell brings in, as a silent partner at the outset, a man named Bill Devery, William S. Devery, who was the uh, former chief of the Metropolitan Police and is a Tammany Hall lieutenant with a lot of influence. And with Farrell and a couple of other guys, Tom McLean, uh, a, a real estate guy who bought the land, uh, and Gordon as a front man, they are able to acquire a plot more than large enough to build a ballpark at 168th Street and Broadway, where the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center now is, and they build a ballpark called Hilltop Park, which opens in 1903. And in fact, Joseph Gordon, the original backer, uh, later became a figurehead president for the first couple of years the Yankees were here. And the writers, again, trying to find a name for the ball club, decided Gordon Highlander's fit, particularly since 168th Street is a high piece of ground in Manhattan and Washington Heights, that they would be called the Gordon Highlanders, a similar idea that worked about 20 years, 25 years later, when the New York Rangers hockey team was called the Rangers because the principal owner was Tex Rickard, and they became Texas Rangers. But in any case, the Gordon Highlanders, or the New York Highlanders, they played at Hilltop Park. And they are the New York Yankees, starting in 1903. And there are heavy player raids going on now, where the backers of the American League teams are hiring National League talent to jump from the National League to come play in the American League. At this point, once the New York franchise becomes established, title clears on the land, and a ballpark is to be built, the National League says, okay, no mas. We now advance to, to uh, the peace thing. And in 1903, a national agreement is written by uh, the same Mills, by the way, who chaired the committee that decided that at the double day in baseball, uh, Mr. Uh, Bills was also a one-time president of the New York Athletic Club. And in any case, he writes a national agreement that recognizes the American League as a major league, binds the two leagues together, and also includes all the principal minor leagues in an organization called the National Association. So what in effect you have here is a tripartite agreement that ties together the National Association, which is all the principal minor leagues, with the American League and the National League, creating an organizational structure called organized baseball. There's no commissioner, it's run by a commission. The presidents of the two leagues and the third member chosen by them. The member they choose is Gary Herman, who is the owner of the Cincinnati Reds, who is certainly known to Van Johnson from his days as a sports writer in Cincinnati. And since he's a National League owner, he's acceptable to the other National League owners. So Gary Herman, in effect, becomes the commissioner of baseball. And the, the three men 
uh, formed the National Commission, and they run Major League Baseball until the 1920s when the Black Sox scandal forced the owners to hire a commissioner. It's a former federal judge named Kennesaw Mountain Landis, but that's somewhat ahead of our story. But that is how we got to have three Major League Baseball teams in New York. And that condition remained from 1903 to 1957. One of the pieces of the national agreement was that no franchise could move for 50 years. So it wasn't until the end of the 1952 season that members who had signed that agreement could even consider moving. And it was in March of 1953 that the Braves moved from Boston to Milwaukee and set in motion the entire train that eventually led to the movement of the Giants and Dodgers to California and by implication, the creation of the New York Mets as an expansion team in 1962.